A few years ago, our world was a little bit rocked because we started to recognize how many of the patients who we see with sinus headache actually have migraine. We found that only 3% of patients who have self-diagnosed migraine headache, or in some studies up to 5%, actually have rhinosinusitis as the primary cause of their headache. And those patients, when they were evaluated, not only had head pain, or they also had pain typically in distributions in the face that are not thought of as typical to migraine. When that same group of patients was examined by three physician groups, allergists, otolaryngologists, and neurologists, dramatically different kinds of diagnoses were made based on the paradigm that those professional groups use to view those patients. The otolaryngologists had a tremendous tendency to diagnose sinus headache and recognize allergic headache, but recognized a migraine in less than 10% of these individuals who overwhelmingly had migraine. Neurologists didn't recognize sinus headache at all, and allergists had the highest recognition of what they called allergic headache and a little less sinus headache. Today, I hope to rock our perspective in our view of otologic disease based on simply an increased awareness of what migraine is in both its classic form and then to take a look at pathophysiology of migraine and to investigate where in this known pathophysiologic model otologic symptoms and specifically vertigo may be created as a symptom which a patient will present to our office. Well, we've all been born and bred, we've been raised looking at these IHS criteria for migraine. They are very important and they are very useful. We have criteria for migraine without aura and criteria for migraine with aura. These are very important if you're doing epidemiologic studies or drug efficacy studies. But in practice, we find that many patients don't meet criteria but will benefit from treatment. I am always repeating to the residents that we learn in black and white, but the world is gray. And it's your work as a otolaryngologist in practice to decipher these shades of gray and to figure out the lines of truth. These criteria, unfortunately, have been so patterned into us that our mental gating has started to allow us to use them as inclusion or exclusion criteria for treatment. So patients who come in who almost have migraine but don't have quite enough symptoms, maybe they don't have photophobia and phonophobia, are told that, well, you don't have migraine and you'll probably just need to treat with over-the-counter medications. This, of course, is extreme blindness on the part of the clinician. Let's take a look at what migraine is in the general population in its classic form, using data from epidemiologic studies, which can only be done well using these definitions. Migraine is present in all age groups and is more common in females than males. It is most common between the ages of 25 and 50, and in that age range, almost one-third of females will have migraine, and 50% of these individuals will have migraine-related disability. That is to say, they can't attend to social or work or family functions because of their headaches. We are starting to understand that migraine is a genetic disease. Twin studies shows a much higher concordance of migraine in monozygotic twins than in dizygotic twins. And a unique type of migraine, which is easy to track, called familial hemiplegic migraine has demonstrated a specific ion channel defect on chromosome 19. About 50% of these patients have a defect in a calcium channel and respond to treatment with a calcium channel blocker. Other patients have sodium channel problems or a sodium potassium ATPase problem. The net result in these individuals is that they have an increased level of neuronal excitability. We think that this is a reasonable model for common migraine, which may be much more genetically heterogeneous. The result of these inherited mutations is that the migraineur has a sensitive brain, and it's sensitive at all times, not just during a migraine attack. So if we look at patients with migraine and without, and we give them what's called an oddball auditory potential and measure a P300 response at the auditory cortex, 
as a result of that auditory stimulus. And then we repeat that stimulus in a control individual, the cortical response drops and remains down. This is cortical habituation to persistent sensory stimulus. Now, a patient who has migraine without aura, who is given that repeated response, actually has more cortical response to the same stimulus at the second presentation, and even more at a third presentation. This is a faulty habituation to sensory stimulus. And this has been demonstrated with visual stimulus and with pain stimulus in migraineurs. This ultimately is a mechanism for sensory triggering of migraine episodes. We know that sensory triggering is only one mechanism of triggering of migraine. We have numerous dietary triggers, and then there are physiologic changes which render migraineur with a sensitive brain susceptible to a full-blown migraine attack. A patient with migraine has triggers. They are adding up in different ways on different days, and if they add up in a way that puts them over their personal threshold, then they'll experience a migraine episode. Now, the explanation for all of this activity has classically been that there are vascular changes in the brain that cause vasoconstriction and oligemia and then vasodilation, which is associated with the painful throbbing portion of a migraine headache. And these are very compelling and it's difficult to ignore these vascular changes. The problem is that it really explains very little about what's actually going on in a migraine attack. If you look carefully, the aura starts during the oligemia, but almost an hour after whatever the initiating event was, the painful throbbing headache begins hours before the vasodilation occurs, and the throbbing headache ends while vasodilation and cerebral blood flow are at their highest. So what really is happening? Perhaps the vascular changes are secondary to another event, that is not so easy to measure. Current understanding of the pathophysiology of migraine has helped us to understand now that what may be happening that is really triggering these changes is an extravasation of inflammatory neuropeptides from unmyelinated C fibers, which are a part of the fifth nerve innervation of the intracranial circulation. Substance P is a particularly strong vasoconstrictor and CGRP, VIP, and neuropeptide Y are also present in these C fibers. So when this toxic environment is present around blood vessels, they become sensitized so that dilated or not, their pulsation becomes painful. We know that in the nasal and sinus mucosa that this results in nasal congestion and a sensation of pressure, and it is quite possible that this kind of phenomena may be happening in the inner ear. Live surgery studies in Boston in the 1940s demonstrated very clearly that there is no sensation in the brain parenchyma, but that all of the intracranial sensation is in the blood vessels and the innervation of the blood vessels. If we stimulate supratentorial vessels, then we get a very characteristic area of referred pain to the periphery that includes one eye, the ipsilateral forehead and temporal parietal region. This is the area that the migraineur holds during a classic migraine headache. Infratentorial stimulation may result in either a helmet-like distribution of peripheral pain or a distribution of pain which rides down behind the ear and into the upper neck. Other distributions often shown to us by patients who have Meniere's disease when they're describing where they feel their pressure. Now, we all know about migraine aura, and we're not aware that only 15% of classic migraineurs have aura. Robert Lashley, in 1941 in Boston, sketched his own aura and hypothesized that something must be migrating across his visual cortex at a two to three millimeters per minute to create this expansion of zigzag black and white lines. Now, we know that this can happen most commonly in the visual cortex, but can happen in any portion of the brain. It can happen over the sensory strip, with causing a migrating numbness, or over the motor strip, causing paralysis and hemiplegia. It can cause aphasia. It can cause vertigo as well.
Now, further investigations with functional imaging in our contemporary understanding of migraine have led us to realize that we can almost always predict the side of a migraine attack by looking for increased metabolic activity in the trigeminal vascular complex in the brainstem. This sensitized trigeminal nucleus is not the only place that is involved, however. Patients may have their own patterns of activity and may have hyperactivity in the hypothalamic nuclei, in the vestibular nuclei, and even in the cochlear nuclei. We acknowledge that there are some symptoms that come from changes in the blood vessels, in the dura, and on the surface of the brain. But there are additional symptoms a migraine which may generate from abnormal electrical activity at the surface of the brain. And finally, there are changes caused by hyperactivity in deeper nuclei in the brainstem. All of migraine, too, is usually accompanied by a substantial systemic parasympathetic outflow. In the nose, this causes lacrimation and rhinorrhea and nasal congestion and soft tissue swelling can cover the entire body. A patient who has a three or four day long migraine generally gains so much water weight that they diuresic off at the end of the attack. Fluid retention and GI symptoms almost always accompany some of our vestibular syndromes. Patients can have cardiac symptoms too. Now, not everybody has a classic migraine headache attack. Patients can present with any variation we know that headache is not even a necessary part of the migraine syndrome and that the headache burns itself out over time so that in older individuals, they are much less likely to have headache. They'll say, well, I don't have headache anymore. I used to have severe migraine. Now I have just some vague pressure, but it's not a headache. I don't want to talk about that. I'm here to talk about my vertigo. Other patients may have symptoms that are more analogous to the fleeting vestibular symptoms they have that are more akin to ocular migraine, a little flashing light that lasts for a few seconds or minutes and then disappears. There's no associated headache. Later on in life, when the headaches have diminished in a migraineur, these associated neurologic symptoms tend to take center stage, but may still follow patterns of sensitivity to migraine. That is to say, they will respond and be provoked by certain migraine triggers even though they are not headaches. And we call these kinds of symptoms migraine equivalents. The time course of these symptoms is extraordinarily variable. A patient may experience symptoms which last for a few seconds at a time, 10 times or one time a day, or have episodes lasting for hours or weeks or even months. So we can't necessarily use a time course as a defining guide for the diagnosis of migraine as vertigo. Now let's step back and take a look at this model of pathophysiology and think about the ear and otologic symptoms. Because of abnormalities of brainstem hyperactivity, specifically in the vestibular nuclei, we may get patients with migrainous vertigo with long-lasting symptoms that don't respond in any way to peripheral vestibular suppressant medications. This is a typical part of their presentation. They may have such faulty processing of peripheral vestibular tone and information that they have extreme motion intolerance, even to motion of their own head. If it involves the cochlear nuclei, then they may experience hyperacusis, which is indeed recognized as one of the cardinal symptoms of IHS migraine. Are there patients who actually have vertigo symptoms that come from the cortex? Well, yes. I have a handful of patients who have episodes of vertigo that last from 10 minutes to an hour and that do not respond to vestibular suppressants and the end of their vestibular symptoms is uniformly heralded by a large classic migraine headache with throbbing, photophobia, phonophobia, aggravation by head motion and response to tryptans. And they only have these headaches with aura and their aura happens to be a vestibular because they're having a cortical spreading depression over the vestibular cortex. Patients who have symptoms, particularly in the posterior fossa, may refer pain to the ear because the external components of the ear are innervated by the trigeminal nerve, but also C1 and C2, which also innervate the posterior fossa structures, and that may present as otalgia or as aural pressure. Now, the inner ear is where this gets interesting. 
is there inflammatory peptide release in the inner ear that could be generating otologic symptoms? Are patients more susceptible to BPPV or Meniere's disease and can acute vestibulopathy that is interpreted as a vestibular neuronitis by default and habit, possibly a form of migraine manifesting in the vestibular apparatus? Of course, the blood vessels of the eighth nerve itself are innervated with these same neuropeptide-containing C fibers and may be subject to their own sort of vertigo symptoms. Well, can migraine mechanisms really injure the labyrinth? I think that's an important question here because we are implying that some very dangerous things could be happening in the migraine pathophysiologic cascade and that the inner ear may be an innocent bystander. Well, we do know that a substantial portion of migrainous vertigo patients have vestibular weakness, and people have a hard time explaining why they do have vestibular weakness. We also know that a very high percentage of patients with Meniere's disease have migraine, and Meniere's disease is just a deterioration injury of the inner ear. The incidence of IHS migraine in Meniere's disease is 54%. That's four times the one-year prevalence of migraine in the general population. And it's also twice as common to have migraine in BPPV patients. Well, to understand possibly how this might be true, we need to enlarge our model to include vanilloid receptors. Vanilloid receptors are all over our bodies, but they're also in the intracranial vessels. They're calcium channels, they're on these unmyelinated C fibers, and they're deformable by heat, by acidity, and even mechanical force. When these inflammatory peptides are released, there is a resulting burning sensation. And when we overstimulate these C fibers, these very peptides injure and cause a regression of the C fibers that they came from. So it's like a small pancreas that has autolysis happening from overstimulation. In fact, that is the basis of capsaicin therapy in chronic pain. And as we know, many patients with sinus migraine do get help with capsaicin nasal sprays by just this very effect. And many patients who have V2 migraine in their sinuses do get better temporarily, maybe for six or eight months, after a functional endoscopic sinus surgery because we are denervating the most heavily C-fiber innervated portion of the nose, the osteomedial complex. Now, if we look at the vanilloid receptors which are present in the inner ear and we stimulate them with capsaicin, we get this rather impressive improvement in cochlear blood flow. And if we block them, we don't get any improvement. There doesn't seem to be any change with their stimulation on the endocochlear potentials. But what there is, is a flat, modest threshold elevation across all frequencies that is associated with a blunting of the tuning curve. Now, this is an unusual blunting of the tuning curve because usually when we blunt a tuning curve, the rest of the tuning curve gets wider. And so there's no good explanation for this right now. We do know that there are vanilloid receptors on the stereocilia of both the inner and outer hair cells in mammals but their functional significance is unclear. Some excellent work by Zoltan Vass in Portland has demonstrated that the inner ear is innervated by V1, the blood vessels of the inner ear are, and that if you stimulate V1 electrically, you can provoke fluid extravasation in the cochlea, in the spiral medialar artery. And conversely, if you stimulate the cochlea vessels with capsaicin, you can cause fluid extravasation in the basilar artery, which is innervated by other branches of D1. So these are rather impressive physiologic changes caused by C-fiber stimulation in the end organ. So let's take a look at our classic model of blood flow and peptide extravasation and imagine the kind of chemical and vascular changes that could go on in the labyrinth if indeed these events do happen in the labyrinth. Could these events occur in the vestibular end organs themselves? Well, we don't know. There is no RO1 grant that is studying the effects of these inflammatory peptides on the end organs. Could they occur in the vestibular nerve, in the cochlear nerve, in the endolymphatic sac? Is there any evidence to support these ideas? Well, let's take a look at just some 
of the clinical similarities between otologic disease and migraine, which are a little difficult to ignore. First, in Meniere's disease, both Meniere's disease and migraine have this very definite characteristic that attacks can be triggered. Salt is a big provocateur for many migraineers as well as for Meniere's patients, and that is because dehydration is a very strong trigger for migraineurs. Caffeine and chocolate are particularly stimulating for many Meniere's disease patients, as is alcohol, which not only contributes to dehydration, but because alcohol is often associated with complex fermentation products, which are known to be migraine triggers. Stress, we all have Meniere's disease patients who have Meniere's attacks in response to stress. And if among the physiologic triggers for migraine, stress holds both the number one and number two positions for the most common triggers. We all know that allergy can aggravate Meniere's disease and that patients with Meniere's disease who are identified to be allergic, and there are many of them, and who are treated with immunotherapy actually have a reduction in the number and severity of Meniere's episodes. Well, the same is true in patients who have migraine. In addition, when we think about possible effects on the vestibular end organs themselves, in Meniere's disease, there's an initial excitation followed by a dense inhibition. And this is what we see in the cortical spreading depression. There's a wave of excitation followed by inhibition at the cortex. So could this be happening in the sensory epithelia directly in response to peptide release? We know that patients with Meniere's disease, they have a seven to 10 year course of activity before the ear burns out. Well, in the same way, migraine pain burns out in the lifetime of a migraineer. These C fibers may burn themselves out and result in patients not having severe headaches anymore, which are centered around blood vessels around the brain. And so this same phenomena could be happening in both groups. When we look at the epidemiology, as I mentioned, the 55% of Meniere's disease patients have IHS migraine within a year, and that is much higher than the 13-year, one-year prevalence of migraine. And if you have bilateral Meniere's disease patients, 85% of those individuals have IHS migraine. If we look at the lifetime prevalence of Meniere's disease, it's 43% female to 18% male. Well, that follows the female-to-male ratio that we expect in migraine. So it is very difficult to ignore that kind of a similarity. If we look at the hydropic ears, we can see that hydropic ears do indeed have about 70% fewer C fibers by the time they're in this pattern of injury and that their cochlear blood flow is impaired. And we can generate high drops in animals experimentally and cause a reduction in capsaicin-induced cochlear blood flow changes. Well, there's also a coincidence of migraine and BPPV. If you take a look at BPPV that is secondary to head trauma or surgery, then the migraine prevalence is about 13%. But in patients who have idiopathic BPPV, their migraine incidence is about three times higher than the general population. Another study found that BPPV patients are two times more likely to have migraine than age and sex matched controls, and that the odds ratio of BPPV in individuals with migraine is 7.5 for age and sex matched controls. And here's a patient, she is one of about 10 patients I've met so far who have chronic and recurrent BPPV, and who has had this for over five years, and whose recurrent episodes of BPPV stopped with migraine therapy. Now, the reason I started to do that was that I had one individual who came who said, I get BPPV, it's always in this ear, I get it fixed by a physical therapist who I know, who has been very effective for me, and I do well for about eight weeks until I get a severe cluster of migraine headaches and it's always an association with that cluster of migraine headaches that my BPPV starts again. And so we prevented her headaches, and she has not had recurrent episodes of BPPV. So this was a four-year-long pattern that was interrupted with migraine prophylaxis. Now, finally, let's talk for a minute about 
migrinus vertigo. Well, migrinus vertigo was established with diagnostic criteria by Hannelore Neuhauser and her colleagues in Germany in 2001, and she defined definite and probable migrinus vertigo, when basically if a patient has vertigo and IHS migraine, and they have some migraine symptoms during their episodes, well then it's very likely that their vertigo is an epiphenomena of their migraine. But she went on to define probable migraine vertigo as well because so many patients didn't have headache at the time of their migraine episodes. And she stretched so far as to say that even just a response to migraine therapy for a patient with symptomatic episodic vertigo was enough to apply this diagnosis. And a lot of people have objected to that, but whether or not they object, it's hard to, I think people have gotten a little bit lost in trying to look at these criteria and ignore the pathophysiology, which we've just spent the last 30 minutes looking at. What we want to remember is that migraineous vertigo should be very common in our practices. Because 15 to 20 percent of the population will have migraine and 25 percent of those migraineurs will have vertigo at some point in their life, we are going to have migraineous vertigo patients at 10 or 20 to 1 for every classic Meniere's disease patient we see just by epidemiology. And that's based on all of the best estimates of the incidence of Meniere's disease in Europe and Japan and in the United States. So there is a tendency to younger patients because migraine tends to occur in younger patients, but it can occur in older patients as well. The patients may describe spinning, they may describe lightheadedness. The one symptom that is almost pathognomonic for migraine vertigo is rocking. The vestibular apparatus usually cannot create a back and forth sensation or a to and fro sensation, with a rare exception, like a patient with a broad superior canal dehiscence and pulsatile oscillopsia. That is easy enough to rule out or to suspect because of other symptoms and signs and radiologic findings. So a patient who comes to you with a rocking sensation basically has migraineous vertigo until proven otherwise. As we mentioned, the time course may be extraordinarily variable and it may present as just a constant disequilibrium and it may be lasting for months. There is triggerability and aggravation by foods or stress or motion, and there's a sense of threshold that the patient will tell you about. They say, you know, I ride in the car and I know I'm doing badly, and I know that if I get out, when I know that I'm feeling badly, I'll be okay, but if I insist a little bit too much, then I will begin a cascade that I have no control over, and I'll pay for that insistence for six or eight hours. That kind of triggerability is unique in vestibular disease, except in some of patients with Meniere's disease who may actually have this kind of a mechanism behind their problem as well. The typical migraine headaches only occur while the vertigo is happening about half the time. So patients may only have a prior history of migraine. They may say, well, no, no, I don't have headaches anymore. This is not a headache-related problem. They may just have head pressure. They may have a family history or they'll insist that their sister got the migraines in the family and I never did get them. But it's showing up in a different way in a different individual. You send these patients for an ENG and although they may have a caloric weakness that you don't know what to do with, they may also in a young individual have saccade or tracking abnormalities which are premature for their age group. But much more common than that is the report that they could not finish the caloric testing because they became so nauseous during the caloric sale and that the ENG provoked or triggered a prolonged episode of vertigo. They said, you know, I was wrecked after that ENG for the rest of the day and into the next day. And when they give you that report, it's much more likely that they have migraineous vertigo than any other diagnosis. So how do we manage it? Well, I show them how everyone has inherited a migraine threshold and that there are different triggers and they add up in different ways on different days. And this may be a weather change. This may be the cup of coffee they had in the morning. This may be in their menstrual cycle. And this may be missing a good night of sleep one time. 
And individually, they're all fine, but any two of them together adds up and puts them over threshold and can initiate an event. I explained to them that there are two ways to treat. One is to remove triggers so they don't break threshold so often, and the other way is to take medications to elevate the threshold. And I suggest usually that they do both until they're better, and then we relax treatment to see how far we can relax it and maintain symptomatic improvement. And they don't have control over many of these triggers, but they have complete control over what goes in their mouths. So I give them a very scary looking no list of foods that is very comprehensive and that is going to wreck their social lives and family lives. And then I give them an alternative list called a yes list made by a dietitian who was a patient of mine who just made a list of products. It's 20 pages and it says, you buy these things at the grocery store. These are products which have no migraine ingredient in them. So you'll have a new selection of cereals, of crackers, cheese, virtually every food stuff. Eat from it, and you can eliminate trigger. Well, some patients say, well, can't you just give me something to take when the episode happens? Well, if it's migraine, you have medicines for that, right? Well, if their episodes are too short, abortive medications are not effective. And in general, even longer episodes don't respond very well to migraine abortive medications. Vestibular suppressants are effective in only about 20% of these individuals, presumably because the majority of patients are having problems which are generating from abnormal electrical activity in the brainstem. And modifying the strength of the vestibular input doesn't really change things very much. If they do have long-lasting symptoms, you're much more likely to get results with promethazine because it is a nausea medication but has a direct effect on a central activity in migraine and can abort migraine headaches. Many patients then require prophylaxis. In order to prevent their episodes, they have to take medications to elevate their thresholds and to prevent future episodes. And it does work. And Tony Mikulik looked at his patients and found that 46% responded to nortriptyline, 25% responded to topiramate, and 16% responded to caffeine elimination alone as a treatment. So 75% of these patients are getting better with some simple treatments and that aren't even carried too far. So one of the most important slides in my presentation is this. You should become, as an otolaryngologist, familiar with and comfortable with prescribing nortriptyline. It is an old, safe, and effective medication. It is an SNRI, but it probably works in these migraineurs because it is a medium potency sodium and calcium channel blocker. And fortunately, patients often respond to it at extremely low doses. I mean, 20 milligrams. I prescribe 10 milligrams before bed and double it to 20 milligrams after a week. And you can titrate it up if they need to, if they tolerate it and they're only getting a partial response, then you can titrate up. The most common thing that patients will experience, and this is about a third of them, they'll sleep well, but they'll wake up a little groggy the next morning for an hour. And in that case, I just tell them to take it earlier in the evening. If you do get the higher doses, you're going to get more side effects. I remind patients when they read the terrible side effect profile that they get from the pharmacist that they are taking one-tenth of the antidepressant dose, and most of those side effects don't really apply to them. Now, if that doesn't work, and it does take different tries, and my average is probably about 2.3 or 2.2 medications per patient to find something that works. So you have to have a second and a third line. And usually from nortriptyline, I go to topiramate, which is a sodium channel blocker. Remember, all of these classes of medications are ion channel blockers to treat ion channelopathies inherited in their family. So they're sodium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and verapamil is very effective, but usually I go to it after topiramate and Propranolol. And then if patients do have the rocking sensation, I'm a little earlier to go to clonazepam at low doses of quarter milligram BID or a half milligram BID. But it is more uniquely effective for that particular patient group. So in conclusion, I hope that I've helped you to approach an appreciation that otologic symptoms may actually develop as a part of a spectrum of migraine-associated symptoms and that in some individuals, 
who are susceptible migraine can cause other otologic disease. It's hard to ignore in otology now, and especially in rhinology even, that familiarity with migraine and the ability to treat it without relying on our neurology colleagues is going to be a very necessary part of our practice. So our take-home message is that if you're seeing patients with sinus disease or otologic disease or vertigo, what we're talking about today, and they do have migraine, treat